thank you that hearts will be delivered. I thank you that the captive will be set free. Father God, I thank you that the word will go forth unhindered and uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic force. Father, I thank you that is none of me and all of you, Father. Lord God, and I will be careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory for everything that you do in this place today. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen. Praise God. It's so good to be here. And, um, you know, I've been away for a while, but I'm so excited. God's been dealing with me and showing me some things about destination and predestination and our steps being ordered by the Lord and how everything in our lives is already predestined. So our position is to get in line and to receive that. And so what I'm going to do today is start what I know is going to be a series of of just teaching you and talking to you about how to reach your destination. And ultimately, what I want to share with you is if you, I just want to encourage you to stay the race and finish the course. And in order to do that, you're going to have to trust God. And you're going to have to know in the depths of your heart that you can trust him. You're going to have to know in the depths of your heart that he loves you. And we're just going to make it together, I'm telling you. I just want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank you all for tuning in throughout the world here at WAIN and to hear us here at Established Heart Ministries. We don't take you for granted. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to us and to worship with us and to just share in the word of God with us. And my prayer is that you're constantly just encouraged and you're blessed And the great thing about internet television is you can always go back and watch it over and over and over and over again. And I hope that's what you've been doing on these couple of weeks that I've been away. I hope that you've just been kind of looking at the reviews and watch. And when I say reviews, I mean watching the past recordings and being blessed by those and taking notes on those. Because basically what we're going to start talking about today is actually a continuation of what we've been talking about is just with a twist and with another dynamic and one of the reasons I think that God started dealing with me on this because for all of my life I've heard people say well you know our lives are predestined you know God knew what was going to happen before it happened God knew you were going to be in that place before any of that stuff even happened and in all transparency oftentimes growing up I would think well if God knew that was going to happen Why didn't he stop it? Or if God knew that it was going to turn out that way, why didn't he interrupt and intervene? And so as I got older, it started just really baffling me. And then there was even a a time in my life that I wasn't, I didn't understand. I started kind of getting a little confused about it. And God is not the author of confusion. So when I just settled it within myself, well, you know what? I trust God. So I trust God with my life. So regardless of What happens to me and what's going on, I know my purpose, I know my calling, and I'm just going to stand in that, and I'm just going to be everything that God has called me to be. Well, God is so faithful, and I now have a clear understanding of predestination. I have a clear understanding of purpose. I have a clear understanding of how, although God predestined our lives, how sometimes things can kind of get crooked on the winding road. But his best and his will is for us to still arrive there. And those are the kind of things that we're going to talk about. So if you're one of those people who who's like I was and that really just that wasn't clear and I really didn't understand. I think quite frankly, the reason people, pastors, ministers and evangelists, different people would throw that out there and just kind of leave it and let it rest. And everybody would kind of sink in that is because I really don't think a lot of people have a clear understanding on it. So I praise God and I thank God that he's starting to give a lot of revelation on that. And I just want to share what he's shared with me so far. And we're going to go through this together and we're just going to enjoy the word of God. And as we move forward through talking about your life is predestined, your life, you do have a destination from, for God that God has placed on your life. You do have a purpose. You do have a place in society. And here's the thing. We have been made. God created us as pre as uh, mortal age, free mortal agents. 
And that right there is the reason that our decisions affect and have to determine the route that we're going to take. Now, the great thing is at the end of the day, even if you make a bad decision, if you make a choice, that's not the right choice. If you don't get stuck in that, you will still arrive at your destination. Mothers, fathers, don't worry about that child who's got off on the wrong path. The Bible clearly states that if you train up a child in the way that he should go, when he gets old, he will not depart. And when I say he, I don't mean the species of, I don't mean the gender male, female, gender. I mean the species of man, which covers both male and female. So the Bible says that when he gets old, he will not depart. Now, that doesn't mean when he gets 15, when he gets 18, when he gets 20. It means basically that there may be some straying that will come along before he reaches the age of old, whether that's 30 or 40 or whatever that is, that he may, he or she may get off the path a little bit. But if you just stay in faith and if you've imparted to that child what they're supposed to have, or even if you didn't, and now you're praying for your child, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Please understand that child is going to get in, in right standing with God. And that child is going to get back where he or she is supposed to be. So all you have to do is just trust God. God. God knows where your child is. God knows what your children's what your children are doing, and he has he will never leave you. He will never never forsake you. And because of you, there's a hedge of protection around them, and they can only go so far before the blood of Jesus says, "That's it, back off." They belong to me because of your prayers. So that's what you have to do. Now, I don't know why I took that rabbit trail. I don't know who that's for, but whoever that's for, you take that, you receive that, and you trust God and give him the praise when you see the manifestation. Now, stay the course and finish the race. One of the, one of the ways that you're going to have to do this is you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. Because although your life, just because your life is predestined, and although your life is predestined, that does not mean that Satan and all the cohorts are going to back up and say, okay, well, you know what? Her life is predestined. God already has a plan for her. So there is nothing we can do. Let's just back off. And what that really means is this person is a threat. They're going to affect everything that we're trying to do. They're going to turn it around and put people on the pathway to God. So we need to intervene that and we need to stop that because see, if you weren't a threat, you probably wouldn't have them. You probably wouldn't have the challenges that you do. So your job and your responsibility is to take the word of God and take life by force. And you, 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 we should be this. We should be the Joshua generation, the generation that we march around walls until the wall comes down. We don't wait until the water start moving. We move and we, we move and we walk in faith, knowing that when we reach the water, then it'll move. So we don't wait for things to happen. We're the generation that's supposed to make things happen. And I think that's the challenge with a lot of Christians today. We sit back and it's amazing how I talk to people and they actually think that they can just sit back, do nothing, and God is going to just come in and take care of everything that you're trusting him for. And you don't have to do a thing. Faith is an action word. And so when you move out on faith, God takes his super and he adds it to your natural. And he gives you supernatural ability to get results. And you better believe as you start moving forth and doing things in Christ, the anointing will break the yoke. So don't forget to factor in the anointing. But you cannot sit back and say, well, you know, I don't have to worry about it. I know I'm not working, but God has a job for me. Nobody's going to come to your door and knock on your door and say, I heard you were looking for a job. No, you've got to get up in the mornings just like it, just like you did when you were working. Wash your face, take a shower, brush your teeth, put on some clothes, and you go move forth in action. You go move forward in faith as if I, I'm already working. I received my job. Go at least get out of my, in the mix and see what's going on. And if something negative has happened to you, if you've lost your job, don't look at that as a failure. 
Don't look at that as what am I going to do now? Look at it as an opportunity to branch into something that you've always wanted to branch into. Look at it as an opportunity now to make a shift in a different direction, to start your own business, to do whatever you need to do. And once you do that, then go back and start working for somebody else. But there are so many things, and I'm just laying the foundation here. So I know usually we go through a lot of scriptures, a lot of scriptures. But today, I'm going to lay a firm foundation on all the things that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. And then after that, we're going to try to start having a talk show format on some days. So we'll talk about all that later. But don't when, when a crisis comes, when a challenge come, it's all about how you see it. And I know you've heard over the years, and at a risk of sounding cliche-ish, it's, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Are you going to see this at, are you going to become devastated and, not, and you're going to stand back and say, I don't know what I'm going to do next? Or are you going to see this as an opportunity to step out and do all of the things that you didn't have the opportunity to do when you were working for somebody else for 12, 13, 14 hours a day? So if the answer is, and it should be, you're going to step out into something different, because I'm, I'm telling you, great things will rise from adverse situations. Great things can come out of challenging situations if you be assertive enough, if you decide that you're going to take life like a storm, if you're going to if you're going to just storm in there and you're going to take what is rightfully yours, everything that belongs to us. God has already left it. The challenge is we don't go out and receive it. We don't go out and we don't pursue it. We don't go out and recover all. Everything that God has given to us and that God is going to do for us, he's already done it. What we don't do is we don't function and operate in the grace. God has graced us to have and to do and to be everything he's created us to do and to be and to have. All we have to do is receive and walk in that grace. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. So you can't, you, you can't, and another thing, you can't, we're going to talk about as we go along is procrastination. We're going to talk about the many things that I see happens that allow people to not receive what God has left for us. And one of the things is an enemy called procrastination. We wait and we wait. And it's always, well, you know what? I'm going to do this when that happens. Or I, I'm, I grew up in the country. And I was around people a lot of times who said, you know what, I'm finna, I'm, I'm finna, I'm finna go and I'm going to apply for college. I'm finna go and I'm going to read that book. I'm finna go and I'm going to do this. And I'm telling you the truth. They, all they sit back and do is I'm finna do this. I'm finna do that. And they fit in to do, but they never execute a plan. They never, they never even make a plan, let alone execute one. So you have people that, that, you know, there, there are females that's been with men and men that's been with women for 50 years. They've been saying, well, you know what? I'm going to do this or I'm finna do this. Honey, look, if, if he is not your Boaz, which means he's not a part of your destination, then you need to say, see you by next and move on. You don't have time to allow anybody or anything to hinder you from what God is calling you to be. And that's what I'm going to encourage you to do in these last days. If something comes along, whether it's a friend or whether it's you know, a, a job that you currently have, whatever it is, if it's not fulfilling or if it's not doing what it needs to do to fulfill your destination or to help you to make it to your destination or into your future, you need to let it go. Because it's not it's, it's not doing anything positive to help you to get where you're going. Because the truth of the matter is, if God gave you a vision, he will give you and make provision. But you have got to do your part. And you can't do that if you're procrastinating and if you if you if you fit in to get up. You can't fit in to get up. You got to go on and get up and start moving. And when you start moving, I promise you, the anointing will kick in. God will start, he, it'll start out like, you know, a lamp unto your feet. You only see a little bit at first. You can only see where you're standing. 
But as you start moving, and as you start moving in faith, it's like that lamp that was until your feet becomes a light until your path. And you start seeing things clearly. You start moving clearly. You start operating in the things of God. God starts, you start, you, you see the favor of God start moving because now you understand that you have to put a demand on the Holy Spirit. You have to put a demand on the word of God because after all, God left us his word as a blueprint, a blueprint to live holy, a blueprint to receive all the things that he has left for us. But what we do is we treat the word of God as if it's a mystery, if we read it at all. And the Bible clearly states, is a candle lit to be hid under a bushel. And I'm here to tell you, no, it's not. The word of God, God did not have his word written for it to be a mystery to people. If he was going to do that, he could have, he should have and could have kept it to himself. But that wasn't the plan. The plan was for it to be a blueprint. But what happens is we, it's so sad that you, you go into a house now, don't go into folks' houses and start looking through their Bible for money. But you walk into a house, and because folks don't read their Bibles, anything that you want to hide is probably hidden in the Bible. Folks have money hidden in the Bible. Not my house because I read my Bible, all of them that's there, so there's no money hidden in any Bibles in my house. In fact, I don't even keep a lot of cape cash at my house, so let's clear that up. <laughs> so, But people hide things in their Bibles. Why? Because they're not go they know they're not reading it. Birth certificates from 1921, where are you going to find it? In the family Bible. Why? Because it's safe there. Nobody's reading it. And that's a shame because how are you living a Christian life? How are you living a life of victory in Christ? How are you living a fulfilled, happy, joyful life in Christ if you're not even reading the word of God? If you don't know what it says? You know, and I know some of you are thinking, well, Ovetta, you're talking as if, you know, if we're doing that, you know, that we're not going to have trials. We're not going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. That's not a bad confession. You're going to have trouble. That's not a bad confession. That's simply telling you what the Bible, that what the word of God and what the Bible says. The Bible says in this world, you will have trials. You will, have, you will have tribulations, but if you continue to read, the Bible also says, but be of good cheer. We've overcome the world. Our part is easy. All we have to do is stay the course, and you'll finish the race. But what happens is you, you hadn't read the Bible. To, you hadn't read the part about, but be of good cheer. We've overcome the world. You just heard somebody give a portion of a message that says, in this world, we're going to have trials and tribulation. So what you've done is you've decided, okay, the Bible says that in this world, I'm going to have trials. I'm going to have tribulations. So I'm just going to sit down in the middle of the trial. I'm going to sit down in the middle of the tribulation. And if you have read the Bible yourself, if you have studied, if you had studied to show yourself approved, then you would have known that the rest of that said and the rest of that reads, be of good cheer for we've overcome the world. So you don't sit in the middle of your trial. You keep moving. You keep trusting God. You keep being assertive. You go out aggressively and you take what God has left you and you take it by force in the name of Jesus. So what you have to understand is in your life, God's will can and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And how is it in heaven? Things are okay. All the needs are met. Everybody's happy. Everybody is cheerful. Well, you know, um, Sister Ovetta, with everything that's going on, how can you say that everybody can be happy and everybody can be cheerful and everybody can go through life with joy? Because I can say that it's a decision. We are free mortal agents. You can make the decision. I'm going to look at this, this trial. I'm going to sit in the middle of it, and I'm just not going to move until the trial is gone. Or you can say, I will not allow this trial 
I will not allow this tribulation to keep me from my destination. I'm going to make it. My life is predestined. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to keep moving in God. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to finish this race. And you can do that. But we, what you got to understand is your this battle is not yours. This battle is the Lord's. And what you have to understand is it is not a natural battle. Yes, it may be that natural individual that's attacking you. It may be a person that's being mean-spirited to you. It may be an individual that's uh, falsifying documents on you, that's lying on you, that's doing everything that you could never imagine an individual to do. But I want you to know that your weapons are not carnal. But they are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. For the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and spiritual wickedness that's written in high places. So you are going to have to win this battle by prayer, by supplication, and executing a plan. Don't sit in your closet seven days a week, 24 hours a day, saying that I'm going to pray. Well, honey, you need to study the word pray and get up and execute a plan understanding that all things work together for the good to those who love the lord and are calling to his purpose i remember i went i was going through something so about a year ago and it was i don't know i, I guess some people would, would consider it devastating but i was talking to a friend of mine one day who and we have been friends since college we grew up together spiritually and I remember, and, she, and I was just kind of telling her some things and what I was going through. And she, and she laughed and she said, well, you know, one thing we know for sure, honey, and that is all things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and are calling to his purpose. She said, and I have known you since your second year in college, and we all know that you love the Lord. So automatically you know that everything is going to work together for your good, but you can't just sit down and say everything is going to work together for my good and not make a plan and not execute the plan. Start moving. And you say, well, you know, I don't even know what I want to do. I don't even know what God is calling me to. I don't even know where, where I'm going. Well, start serving somebody. Just start doing something for somebody else. Once you get involved with helping other people, doing stuff for other people, I promise you, just as sure as I'm standing here today, once you start doing that, your vision, your purpose, if it was cloudy, it'll start coming clear. Because Why? Because you're showing yourself to be faithful over a few things. God will make you ruler over many things. You just be faithful over the, that you can be faithful to. You just be faithful with that that's there right before you. You just be faithful and serve your family. That's right there at your fingertips. Unfortunately, sometimes because our family members are right there with us, we have a tendency to take that for granted. We treat people on the outside better than we do people that's right there with us instead of serving them. And the Bible clearly states charity begins at home and then spread abroad. So you can't say, well, you know, I would go to Africa, and I would have some folks if I could just get over there. Just go next door. Somebody could be hungry next door. You don't, you know, God's blessings aren't going to rain on you just because you fly all the way to Africa to feed somebody. Go next door and make sure your neighbors aren't hungry. Go across the street and make sure that person's not hungry. You know, go cut some retired person's grass. There are just a plethora of things that you can do to honor God. And all that you do, just do it in the name of Jesus, knowing that God sees you and he will honor you. Not You're not doing it for the praises of man. You're doing it because you want to show God that he can trust you. You want to show God that, yes, God, I am a servant and how Ever you want me to serve you, I will serve you. He may not have called you to minister verbally. He may not have called you to preach out of a pulpit. He may not have called you to teach on a television station. But what he did call you to do is to sweep the front yard. Well, guess what? As long as you're doing what God has called you to do, and you're doing it to serve God, and you're doing it as an honor unto God, your, your reward is going to be just as great. Because it's not about what you're doing. It's about the fact that you are serving God. And that's what you have to focus on. Not focusing on the negative. Not focusing on the tragedy. Because whatever you put your attention to, that's what's going to grow.
Whatever you give your attention to, that's what you're going to feed life into. If somebody is saying something ugly about you or nasty towards you or something that is not a part of your destiny or something that's not fulfilling your destiny, then what you need to do, be quiet about it. Be slow to speak. Don't address it. You don't have to defend yourself. God is your hind guard. He's your foreguard. You make the decision. You know what? That is not a part of my destiny. I'm not going to even give life to it. I'm going to turn my back to it. I'm going to ignore it. And what I'm telling you is when you do that, it'll fade away. And, we, and, and, and the great thing about having not defend yourself is that when God reveals, there are no questions to be asked. Nobody can argue about it. You didn't try to influence it by anything that you said. You allowed God to handle it, which showed that you trust him. And that's all God wants to know. He just wants to know that we trust him. And I'm telling you, if you let him know that you trust him and you move forward in faith and you move forward and trust him, trusting him, it is only a matter of time before that baby that you're about to give birth to is born and you're walking in your destiny and you're walking on in victory. And that's just what you have to do. What you have to also understand, and this is funny, but good times don't always look like good times. Harvest time doesn't always look like harvest time. And I'm going to explain to you what that means. That means you may have, when, okay, you may have the best child on the block. But because your child talk a little louder than everybody else in the family, that gets on the household's nerves. You don't see that because, you know, you may be, if, if you look back on your life 20 years ago, I, I'll, I'll use me for an example. About, you know, not very long ago, <laughs> I was a good size four, every now and then size two, you know, but I was constantly thinking, okay, I, I'm not sure that I like this. Oh, I'm not sure that I like this. I don't know about that. Oh, I'm not, I don't know about that. But now when I look back at that, I think, yeah, I didn't look too bad. I, I was a good size. And now if a size two or a size four saw me coming, it would run. But see, then I thought, you know, why, why am I this size? And it was crazy. So see, then when we're in a situation, we don't always realize and see how good it is because something else always looked better. And that's why sometimes we just have to look at things and we have to glory in our tribulation. We know how to be, we, we know how to be content in our situations, knowing how to be content where we are, knowing that it's not everything that you can see, touch and feel is temporal. That means it's subject to change. So what you have to do is find the good in that and enjoy every moment because it's subject to change. It could change in a few minutes. Things aren't always the same. I have a brother who is eight years younger than me. He's a baby. And I can remember when I came home from college once, my, and he was a good kid. I mean, he basically went to school, did, did everything that a child is supposed to do. But he loved television. So I remember coming home from college one weekend, and my mom, then she had emotional issues. Thank God for deliverance. But she had emotional issues then. And the difference between my brothers and I, as we got older, when she would say things to me, I would stop it because I wasn't going to allow her to cause division. But see, that's because I have a really, had and have a relationship with God. She would say negative things to them. Them, they would allow those negative seeds to be planted. So I came home one weekend from college, and my little brother was doing what he does on the weekends. He was just watching television, wasn't hanging out all night, wasn't partying with his friends all night. He was just a reader and loved watching television. So when I got ready to go off to college, she had all these complaints. Well, you know, Spanky this, and I don't know, and Spanky that. And so finally, I looked at her and I said, you know, he's a good child. I said, y your complaint is that he watches a lot of television. I said, but what you don't see is he have all A's. You're not focusing on the fact that he goes to football practice, goes to football games, he comes home, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do any of those things that a lot of your friends 
uh, children are doing. He doesn't do any of those things that you, when you go to, she's in the medical profession, that you have, you know, that a lot of the patients and people that you have to see are involved. He doesn't, he's not involved in any of those things, but you're so busy focusing on the fact that he's on the sofa all weekend watching television. And to you, that's a problem. And I'm thinking about a lot of people I know who would love to have that challenge. Their biggest challenge with their child is they're on the sofa all weekend watching television. So I told us it's all about what you decide to focus on. He is a good child. And I think, unfortunately, oftentimes we do that in life. Instead of focusing on the fact that, you know, I have all of my fingers, I have all of my toes, my body is functional. When I hold the mirror in front of my face and breathe, it fogs up. Things may not be the way I want them to be today, but as long as I'm breathing, life is going to be okay. You know, there are people who don't have function functionality of their limbs, and yet they find a way to glory through that tribulation. And here you are, all you did was smash your finger in the car door, and you want to die, give up, cave in, and quit. And what I'm trying to tell you is if you stay the course, you'll finish the race. Don't give up. Don't cave in. Don't quit because at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's about the, Satan stealing the seed and the word of God out of you so that you cannot fulfill your purpose that God has called you to do. So are you going to sit back and allow him to do that? Or are you going to say, well, you know what? I am the faith and therefore I'm going to take it by force. I am a part of the Joshua generation. So I'm going to go out here and I'm going to take this thing by force. I'm going to be what God has called me to be. I'm going to do everything that God has called me to be. And I am going to enjoy myself on the way. Well, how do you enjoy yourself? You make a decision to do it, and you do it. It is simple as that. And what you have to understand is joy. there's a difference in joy and happiness. Being happy is an emotion that is sparked by something external. I saw that. I like purple. There's a purple hat. Not a hat person. But there's a purple hat. So purple hats make me happy. The challenge with that is when the purple hat goes away, if that's all I had, if, that was, if that's what my foundation was built upon, now that the purple hat is gone, there goes my happiness. Joy, on the other hand, is having a peace and a feeling on the inside of you that it doesn't matter, come what may, it doesn't matter, hell or high water. I have the joy of the Lord on the inside of me. And the Bible says that if Satan cannot steal my joy, he cannot keep what belongs to me. He cannot keep my goods. And that's what I want to tell you. And I'm going to end this in a few seconds. If you don't allow Satan to steal your joy, then you have your strength. He cannot fight you. He cannot defeat you. He cannot overtake you. And you're going to win. But you have to hold on to your joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you lose your joy, then you're weak. And if you allow yourself to get weak to the point that you can no longer battle because you have no joy, then you open the door for the enemy to come in and overtake you. But if you just hold on to your joy, then you hold on to your strength, you hold on to your peace, you hold on to your will to fight, you hold, you, you, you just hold on to everything that God has given you, you fight your spiritual warfare in joy with a peace of knowing that God is on your side, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and as long as God is with you, he's greater than better than the whole world against you, and all it takes is one word from God to change the whole situation, if you can hold on to all of that, I promise you, it's just going to be a matter of time before you get what you're standing there for. And in all of your getting, you just stand there. And how long do you stand there? You stand there until you get what you're standing there for. And if you have that attitude, you won't be standing there long. And the Bible simply talks about that. It talks about that standing. Having done all the stand, stand. How long? Stand there for. And how long is that? You stand until you get what you're standing there for. And here's the thing. Take your time. 
and learn every lesson that you're going to learn as you're standing there. Because what I'm learning, the older I get, is it's not always and usually it's not about us. It's about what we can do to effectively and positively impact the body of Christ so that we can all get there together. Because God is coming back for a a bride without spot, blemish, or any such thing. And it does not make sense for us to go in by the skin of our teeth. It does not make sense for us to go in limping. You know, thank God that he's going to, we're going to have a new body and all those things. But we may as well storm the gates. We may, we may as well go in yelling like David. We may as well go in with excitement. We, we may as well go in and we may as well be able to say, I, you know, I fought a good faith. I, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. And I'm ready to stand before God and say, good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. Come on, I'm going to make you ruler over many. So you come on through the gates. That's what, we're, that's what we're after at the end of the day. But as long as we're here, we may as well enjoy life. Now, it's funny because I, I knew I, I, had, I got up here planning for this not to be very long. And I wanted to lay a good foundation. But there are so many other things that I wanted to cover. We're not going to have the opportunity to cover that today. But that's okay because I am determined to not have a lot of people who were like me, didn't really understand what the predestined was about, didn't really understand what, you know, God knew that was going to happen before it happened, didn't understand any of that. But now I do. I want to share that with you. I want to share with you how your choices affects and because for everything, there's a cause and effect. So how your choices and your decisions make impact and affects what you, your future. But what I also want to encourage you to know is it doesn't matter because as long as you trust God and get back in right standing, God's married to the backside. It doesn't matter where you are. God loves you and he has your life predestined and he has a plan for you. So all you have to do is get in right place. And we're going to talk about how to get in right place and stay in right place. You get in right place. You keep moving. You stay the course. And you finish the race. I love you. I'm so happy you tuned in today and I'm happy you came today. Thank you so much. I don't take it for granted. We love you. We want to thank MyRockBoutique.com for being a sponsor. We appreciate you. And anybody else who wants to become a a sponsor or a partner to this ministry, go to WAIN.TV or go to Established Heart Ministries. Dot net. We love you. God bless you. And I will see you next week. Goodbye. Somebody.